You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. The people that are going to move the needle now, this is the real money. The big money comes in because what you saw in January and February was a retail um, influx. Well, what comes now is managed money, institutions. These guys are going to rotate out of the, the Freeport Mac Morans and the first Quantums and the Capstones. Look at Capstone, went from 50 cents to five and a half dollars. Some of that money is going to rotate into the, the into the best in class juniors because that's where the next 10 bagger is. And when they come in, the, there will be another increase in volume. And all of a sudden, in my opinion, these things shoot up again. Greed happens fast and then everyone wants to pile in. Thank you for tuning in to Mining Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers. We're going to be talking copper today. Joining me is Gianni Kovacevic. He is the CEO of Copper Bank. Uh, we had him on the show a few months ago to profile Copper Bank. That won't be so much the focus of today's show. I asked him to come on and talk about the copper markets, what he's seeing. And specifically, I wanted to, him to talk about some of the bare arguments for copper. Copper has been performing phenomenally well, just $4.50, 10-year highs. So it's easy to latch on to the bullish argument in this environment. But I think when you're intellectually honest, as my wife does to me, she always says, even though she's not an investor, Bill, what happened if you're wrong? Is it good enough now? Do you have enough profit? Can you sell? And so we need to ask ourselves those questions. So Gianni, welcome back onto the program. And as you engage your bullish argument for copper, which you've laid out, your spokesman for this, what are some of the most legitimate bear cases in which we could see a, a, a capping of the copper price and not an expected rise like you've talked about previously? Well, we have to look at this pragmatically. Who in the world wants to pay a lot for copper? Nobody. There's no fabricator or people that make transformers or, or windings or all these different things that, that uh, require copper as an input. And so this what was an unholy alliance for, for many, many years, you had speculators and fabricators, these people that are uh, together make up the copper market. They kind of worked together. There was always someone willing to be negative and they were willing, they were willing to oblige them. And then that breaks down because all of a sudden that market, which is relatively balanced, it's a 25 million ton market. What happens when two or 300,000 or 400,000 tons of metal is taken out of the the regular system and is used for hoarding. And it's, it, it's not gonna go into the hands of a fabricator. All of a sudden, those thousands of people that actually buy copper in quantity, they're tripping over themselves to get quantity, to get, to get material. And we've seen a drawdown in inventories. And so we now where there's this recalibration, people are wondering, will, it, will there be a lot of substitution because the price is high? Are people now going back and buying less and saying, let's see what happens? Because it's a, like a collective, you know, um, I'm not going to say short in the market, but certainly like a, let, let the price uh, abate. Or is business going to be so good that they, they, they have no choice? It's going to be unprecedented. The POs are being issued. Money is going to be allocated because of these trillions of dollars of stimulus money. If you are in the business of making cable, and let's talk about America's largest cable maker. They're, in fact, the largest single buyer of copper. This is Southwire. Business is going to be very good this year. It's going to be very good next year. So are they able to go hand to mouth? And you can reverberate that through, through Europe with Mitsubishi, Pirelli, Japan, and, um, and China. I, I think it's it may be going to continue because uh, the market is very tight, Bill. Jenny, you're outside in Croatia. I should point out for my audio only listeners, if they hear birds in the background, and if you're watching on YouTube, you see the, what is that, the Mediterranean behind you there, Gianni? Yeah, exactly. That's correct. Yeah, the Adriatic Sea. Okay, beautiful. All right. So uh, a couple of things I point down when I think through the lessening of copper demand, obviously we know we use copper in pipes for plumbing, but there is this growing trend in the construction industry to use PEX piping because it's easier and it's more affordable, essentially plastic. Could this be a source of decreased demand that perhaps people aren't factor factoring in accurately in their forecasts? Very good question. And we actually have substituted away from copper for this kind of simple plumbing installations since 40 years. So if you could look at a graphic and look at all the different areas where copper is used, first of all, 75% of all the copper is fabricated into something to, 
to generate, transfer, or utilize electrical energy. And then on the margin, you got a little bit for piping and for gutters and, and roofs and other artistic appeal. So that's not one of the big areas of substitution. It's already occurred. What's really more important is in big power systems, when this, this magic ratio of three and a half to one, talking copper to aluminum, when this goes out of whack, people or look at, at a big project, they then have to look at, well, shall we use aluminum for this particular project or should we use copper? The ratio is not quite there right now because uh, the copper price has come up. Aluminum has not followed suit. We've got dollar ten a pound aluminum and you've got $4.50 a pound copper. Here's the problem. All the things we're talking about with renewable energy, ultra high efficiency, look at a country like Japan. They're not going to install stupid inefficient electrical products so once again they're still even though the price has come up it's not going to prevent you from using copper for big power systems so yes a few things will be substituted and can be substituted but look at the cost bill this is an example that people can relate to if you're building a wind turbine or a, or a park and it's uh, many many uh, hundreds of megawatts it costs rule of thumb about three or four million per megawatt to install that park. There is four to five tons of copper in per, uh, per megawatt in, in that type of installation. So copper is now trading at $10,000 a ton. If it's four tons of copper, that's $40,000 um, per, per, per megawatt of utility. Before when copper was cheaper, it might've been 30 or $28,000. If it, even if it goes up to 50,000 or 60,000, how does that impact when it's $4 million per megawatt for the overall project. It's a rounding error. The same in electric car, same with an electric charger, and, and many of these big applications where, 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 they're, where they're the drivers of what's gonna be five and 6% CAGR growth rate for copper. We can tolerate it, and it's already happened. The real scare happened in 2001, 2002, when copper was trading at an all-time inflation-adjusted low, 70 cents a pound. Copper went up to $2 a pound in the 2004-2005 period, and they were both terrified, uh, miners and fabricators, that people were going to substitute away from copper. That did not happen. In fact, copper went to $4 a pound, and we as a society have been paying an average of, of $3 a pound since the, uh, the, the, the 2005 period or so. So I believe uh, it, it will be tolerated. And it's, it's not a deterrent just because the copper price is re really doubled here in, in, in price. It's not a deterrent, not for 95% of the applications where copper is used today, in my opinion. Johnny, I remember over a decade ago uh, when co the copper price was high uh, in Detroit, people would take vans and they'd go to these abandoned homes one to one and they would literally strip, all, take all that time and do the Ill illegal activity, steal all the copper out of these houses and recycle it. What role, when the copper price gets to such a point, what role is this recycled copper going to perhaps put a damper on the copper price? Well, co recycled copper is extremely important for the market. It's a 25 million ton market, as I've articulated to you. 20 million tons, just over that, comes from primary mining. The other four or five million tons comes from recycled copper. And we can look back over decades. Right now, 16, 17% of the market is provided by recycled copper because we never throw our copper away. It's infinitely recyclable. Not Julius Caesar, not Napoleon, and not today. The single best year percentage-wise was that first big price run-up, which is logical. The price of copper went up a lot. People recycle a little bit more. There was some thieving famously in many different articles over the, the over those uh, that decade. It was about 23, 24% of the market, that the, the single best year. This is like 2005, six, seven period. Right now, it's 17%. It would be logical that a little bit more copper is recycled, but it's not going to save the day. We're talking 2 3 4% here, Bill. The market on 25 million tons, if it's growing by 4 or 5% CAGR, um, that's, that's, that's a little helper, but it's not going to save the day. And we know that it never has in the past. It's not going to be uh, that case going forward. No matter how high the copper price goes, recycled copper will only be maximum 22, 23% of the market.
Dore Copper Mining is a premier, near-term, high-grade copper and gold redevelopment opportunity with tremendous exploration potential only 14 kilometers from the town of Shibugamu in mine-friendly Quebec. Dore Copper is debt-free and owns a 2,700 ton per day mill with an 8 million ton tailings facility ready to be used. There is already power to site and it is accessible by paved highway and rail. Dore Copper aims to produce a profitable hub-and-spoke operation of over 100,000 gold equivalent ounces per year or over 60 million million pounds of copper equivalent by 2024. Because of the existing infrastructure and location, a low capex is anticipated to recommence production. Dore Copper trades under DCMC in Toronto and under DRCMF on the OTC. To learn more, go to DoreCopper.com. That's DoreCopper.com. Okay, so we talk about copper demand, how it's linked to EV adoption. And Gianni, uh, I don't study the numbers the way you do, but I do have a story, an anecdotal uh, example of how I see people perceiving electrical vehicles and their willingness to adopt. I was talking to a close relative recently who is politically left of where I am ideologically, but and we were talking about Tesla and perhaps an EV and for this person, even though they're concerned about carbon emissions, the practicalities of owning an EV and the drawbacks, especially in a Michigan winter with uh, battery life and things like that, it was not great enough for this person to get rid of their in internal combustion uh, engine and adopt an EV. <clears throat> and if that's coming from somebody that's politically left, that's really concerned about carbon emissions, could our forecast for EV adoption not be as, and the rate rate of adoption be a lot uh, lower in reality than what some are forecasting? I think in certain jurisdictions that could be the case, Bill. But the automotive market globally is about 90 million units. America is 17, 18 million. Okay, so then within America, you've got the California, Washington, Florida, Texas, sort of jurisdictions. So let's say half the people in America will never adopt an EV. So that's 9 million of your units. Well, the future of the electric car is not gonna take place in many of these places, especially in, uh, in Texas where gasoline is $3 a gallon. Uh, get gasoline over here in Europe is $10 a gallon. <laughs> it hurts when you fill it up. So I, I look at India, I look at China, I look at Japan and, and the European market. That's, those are the drivers, and they're also the biggest automotive manufacturers, Bill. America produces about 13, 14 million cars a year. Where are the other 74 million cars made? Well, they're made in places that are actually adopting these things, sometimes by force, uh, sometimes with the, really in the European Union. That, that's, it's, it's a Brussels push. In China, it's the government. They've told everyone. Now, this market is 28, 29 million cars. Most important market for everyone. GM, Volkswagen, Toyota, all of them. You must make and sell electric cars in China or you're not going to be in the game. They have no choice. So what we're talking about, 30% uh, penetration in the year 2030 or so, uh, I believe it's attainable. I think it's, it's a global situation. Some countries are going to be more, uh, have more adoption. Other countries will have less. Venezuela, the gasoline's cheap. Kuwait, gasoline is cheap. Texas, gasoline is cheap. Those are not the areas I'm going to focus on. The main thing is that we actually get to about 30% of car sales are EVs. I believe that's very attainable and actually probably will be surpassed. By what year? 2030. Wow. I think 2030. And even if car sales globally, because of consumer behavior is changing. We may not be making and selling 90 million cars a year 10 years from now. It may only be 80 million or 75 million, but the automotive industry in aggregate is going to use more copper because that 30% that's, that, that are pure electric vehicles, we're talking 400, 500% more copper per vehicle. So it's still, it's a good news story for the copper industry and all the other um, infrastructure things that are going to go with those vehicles for the next 20 years until that build out happens. You're not going to recycle one pound of that copper. That'll come later in the life cycle of these vehicles. But the recycling you're going to see now are these old vehicles, especially in the, in the emerging markets, they don't even have power windows or air conditioning. Very little copper to be recycled out of those cars is this whole fleet it gets um, it gets redone, retooled, and all the power that's going to uh, go with it. And it's not going to be the power that we grew up with. This is going to be, in many cases, 
these renewable energy uh, platforms and schemes that are now very commercially viable, need to be augmented sometimes, maybe batteries, maybe natural gas, maybe uh, some kind of a uh, water power system, depending on where you live. But it's um, overwhelmingly bullish for, for electrical uh, power systems. Gianni, when I've talked to copper bears on this show, one of the main things that they point out uh, in their argument is that they are very bearish on the economy, even the global economy. So if we're going to see a global contraction or even a depression and the Chinese economy doesn't grow at the rate that some are expecting, this is all going to mean you know, a, a copper price that is not going to be rising. How would you respond to somebody uh, with this argument? If you put this into three different buckets... Let's call it um, just business as usual. That's easy. That's two percent growth. Um, and then you call it, have hyper adoption because they they however they make this money, they just print it. They go click, ten trillion dollars is created, and then you devalue your currency. But everything is priced in U.S. dollars. That, that's one of the reasons why all these things have moved up a little bit. Uh, the loss of value of the U.S. dollar and. That's the scenario everyone talks about in the, 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 the very um, bullish scenario. But what about epic fail? Really a, a disaster in a global economy. Um, this, this would be a negative. I, I believe that that, that that is something where you would see, um, uh, could there be a lack of growth in copper? Uh, I don't think so. I, st I still think you have growth only because there is this rotation happening on a global scale of of all these uh, inputs, it's happening inevitably. It's going to happen where it's going to really impact, and you're going to see a bigger decoupling. Is that something I've talked about since years? Is this decoupling from oil and oil and copper and 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 gold and oil and how these commodities have this interplay? You, when you have growth, like lithium is supposed to grow by over a thousand percent in the next ten years. So in the scenario you're talking about, there's doomsday, uh, epic fail, and um, of the, of the larger economies, they go into a tailspin, lithium grows by 600% or 700% or 500%. That's massive growth. And instead of copper growing at, we believe it, at the really the heart of this pivot, it could grow at six or 7% growth if the supply is there. If the supply is there and the price doesn't go bonkos to $10 a pound, uh, maybe it only grows at 2% or 3%, but it's growth. Not the demand, I don't lose sleep over that, in any scenario, par for the course, hyper adoption or epic fail, where, where people really need to focus on is supply, no matter what happens, where, where is the copper gonna come from? Because with oil now, it's gonna be a war. Who's gonna produce the last barrel of oil? Um, they're gonna give it uh, into, a, into an input and you're gonna, you're gonna uh, partake in the profits of, a, of something that's made out of that barrel of oil. I'm talking 30, 40 years down the road. Where copper, different story. Where, where will the copper come from? Yep, and that's what you do with Copper Bank. You have kind of an optionality play for copper. I'd like to get your perspective on the type of money that is going into and out of the copper stocks and how the copper juniors are performing. Uh, you said something to me when we spoke, I can't remember if it was on the recording or not, but you said people that know it the best love it the least because they've been disappointed the most. Is there any applicability uh, with this statement of what we're seeing in the copper juniors? Absolutely. People are watching this program. They've probably uh, followed junior uh, copper stocks, they probably own some, and they've seen uh, a big volume ramp up. And all of a sudden now it's like the, the parting of the Red Sea. What's going on? The people that put these junior mining companies on life support and the ones that, that the people that fund them you have to go back to the dark days where no one's writing a check. Well, what does that financing look like, Bill? It is punitive. It's coming with a five-year warrant very close to the probably the issue of the financing. Uh, in many cases, these people are not aligned. They probably don't have a long-term vision. Their money is made with that transaction. If they could rotate the stock, keep the warrant, and now that's happened. There's been a few different rounds of that because these things, this is ruinously expensive. Even though to, to keep a junior, a non-active junior going is very expensive. So what happened when this, when this big volume wave occurred, you saw huge, triple the volume on the TSX venture. This is important, velocity of money, but it was red every day, Bill. Red, 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 red on this huge volume. So you had new money coming in the space, 
People like that narrative, this, this electrification narrative. They were buying shares and certainly copper shares have performed well, but they were obliged by these people that are either really sophisticated, made their money, made their triple or quadruple or five bagger, and they're just disciplined and says, I'm out, wait for the next one. Or they're people that have been in these things for three, four, five, six years, and they just want, they took the liquidity. Those that know it the best, love it the least because they've been hurt the most. In the, in the near term right now, the market is a voting machine, but in the long run, it is always a weighing machine. But who's gonna buy these things? You need to understand fundamentally the DNA, the anatomy of a major mining company. What is their motive? Where will they go? Who makes the decisions? And what will they pay? What will they pay for these things? Because not every copper junior is gonna get bought out. Not every copper project is gonna get developed. And not every copper project is going to have the blessing from a major mining company. Not that they say it's going to become a mine, but at least they take their manpower and they spend the next 10 or $20 million to take it to some sort of a, a next phase or de-risking. Where's your project? You need to know these answers and you need to know uh, what's the plausibility uh, of, of these majors. And I can maybe articulate on, on how I think the people I know, that I, I've, I've dialogued with them. I, I did the, the keynote to the Copper Congress in 2017 in Santiago Anyone who is anyone in copper is there. Uh, I, I know most of these guys. And over the course of many, many dinners and many, many lunches, over 15 years, I, I can bestow a little bit of wisdom and experience on what they're looking for and what, what I believe they're going to be buying, you know, if, if that's of interest to you. Yes, it is. And would you say uh, with the uh, change in money that you said, the, the high volume, that velocity. We, the velocity of money, but it was red. So were a bunch of bag holders created or are these people that should still be convinced to hold on to their copper shares for the ride that you expect to continue? So let's go on that, on that theme. You, you, you're someone, you bought some juniors, they made some money. Maybe things have leveled off and you're wondering where to go to now. Uh, in the long run, the market is a weighing machine. What's it actually worth? Well, what I will tell you, the last time copper was about $4 a pound, the things I'm looking at, the things I own, and I own more than just Copper Bank, they were trading 500 to 1,000% higher during that euphoric time. I'm talking the 2010, 2011 period, or maybe if you go back to the 206, 207 period. I will submit to people they're undervalued. I have a historical precedent. I know from looking at many, many examples of things that were either bought out or were, were trading once upon a time. If copper prices continue to stay at around these levels, is it reasonable to uh, have some sort of guidance that they could come back there again? I think the answer is yes. And who's going to move the market? Fear happens over a long, long period of time, Bill. And it's, it's hard to get over that. But like my friend Robert Friedland would say, when the, when the sentiment changes, it's like a school of fish, just, just like that, because greed happens fast. Go back to December, tax law selling season. Copper Bank was printing you know, 18 cents. 75 days later, it printed 82 cents a share bill. It was still undervalued. But what's the difference? How does the person feel that sold his shares at 16, 17 cents in December or November feel in middle of February when it goes to 82, 83 cents? Greed happens fast. So the people that are going to move the needle now, this is the real money. The big money comes in. Because what you saw in January and February was a retail um, influx. Well, what comes now is managed money, institutions. These guys are going to rotate out of the, the Freeport Mac brands and the first quantums and the capstones. Look at capstone. Went from $0.50 cents to $5.50. Some of that money is going to rotate into the, the, into the best-in-class juniors because that's where the next 10-bagger is. And when they come in, the, there will be another increase in volume. And all of a sudden, in my opinion, these things shoot up again. Greed happens fast. And then everyone wants to pile in. And what's so, the trigger? Is it the copper price that is the trigger this time? Is it $5 I mean, copper? I don't think it's, I don't think we need $5 copper. Certainly it's, it's a headline. We always say to use another Don Cox uh, investment, never invest in the story uh, on, on page one. That's the efficient market. Invest in the story on page 16. That's headed to page one. Well, copper's now flirting with an all-time high, but you don't see anyone talking about investing in development or the, or the R&D of copper, the, 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 the resource that could potentially become a reserve. There is none of that. 
you don't have any kind of the, the this big interest. Uh, I am getting a little bit of people coming in. I get the odd hedge fund or the odd capital group uh, subscribing to my to my um, my triple opt in service. That means they have some junior analyst. Go find out about the space. Tell me who's who, who's got pounds, who doesn't. That that's going to come, and it could happen tomorrow. It could happen in a few weeks. But is this? Uh, push happens. We're, we're 452, 453 a pound today. We're within a nickel, within a dime of the all-time high. And you don't have euphoria. There's no ebullience in the market. So that comes. And I believe it's it's basically one major investor coming in um, and, and endorsing a company saying, I own 10% now, a famous investor, people that maybe I have some ideas on some of the guys that might be coming in. Or what always works, Bill, a takeover. You get a nice M and A. You get a press release saying bigger companies buying the little company, but it won't be a ten or twenty percent premium. You might see a hundred or hundred fifty percent premium overnight, and it's still undervalued. And we know this because last time copper was trading at four dollars, the stuff I look at was five hundred to a thousand percent more expensive. It's it's there's a disconnect there. Either the copper price is going to collapse, either or there's going to be a lack of demand, and you're not going to see pressure from the C-suite, the board of directors of the major mining companies to tell their, their technical people to finally replace you know, reserves that are being depleted. If they can't show growth, they're going to get punished. And these people, these, these, board, these board meetings are only happening right now. The last quarter, hey, it's interesting. Demand's going to be good. Prices are higher. This quarter, you know, these people, are, I believe, are going to have more and more confidence to, to give the, 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 the latitude to their technical people to go and make the next steps. Are they going to go drill on their own? Mm, that's expensive. Takes a lot of time, 10 years to find a deposit. Or are they going to take over a company? Maybe. Or can they actually t- spend the next 10 or $20 million on a porphyry to answer some important unanswered questions? And they can add that. Because when they buy uh, one of these juniors and they buy something that's got, say, 10 billion pounds, that gets re-rated, Bill immediately when a larger company owns it. So it's a, it's a win, win, win. And all that could start happening. But any one of these things could, could be a real pressure point. Um, one more thing I want to add also, because in 2003, when the copper price really moved, this has happened in a stealth way. Why did the copper price move in October 2003? It was a tight market. All the, all the, 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 the inventories were taken. We only had four or five days of, 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 of inventory on a global scale. And then the second largest copper mine in the world had a pit collapse, Grasberg. And then panic. Copper prices just shot up from $2 to $4. We have not had a big act of God or or, or one of these things happen. But the market is so tight that if you did have uh, an issue at one of the major copper mines, or if, if these things in Peru escalate, or if these things in Chile escalate, or if these th- things in other parts of the world start escalating, you could see a copper price go to seven or eight or nine dollars a pound. Now it may not deserve to be there, but that's the mania phase. That's the blow off top. That's so Gian- Gianni, on that point, to your earlier point about how some of the money was using the volume that was created in February to exit, are they saying to us, we believe we've reached a near-term top, that they're selling at this near-term top and these same people might come back in if they expect copper to go down to 350, 325 before the next leg. I would think that would be a mentality of some of the people that participate in those kind of financings to, to, to really save junior mining companies in the, in the, in the lean times. Uh, maybe it'll come to them. I don't, I don't believe it will. I don't think you're going to see that, see that occur because right now, the, there's not a lot of inventory. If, there, if we look at the 70 largest copper projects in the world to be developed, 50 are already owned by a major mining company. And if you look at the four largest that are not owned by a major mining company, Pebble, Cascabel, Tempakin, uh, Azul Azuelos, owned by McEwen Mining, these are projects that are not home runs. You know the issues with Pebble. And then if you go down the next 35 projects, 25 are owned by a major mining company already, 10 are owned by juniors. You know, money is actually being offered to the juniors. There may be an opportunity right now for some of them. They'll, if they're still issuing warrants, I think shame on you. But um, certainly, you'll see that uh, occur. And I think that some of these guys that we're that you're talking about right now, I, 
I don't know if they buy in again. I think they wait for the next bear market. They're, they're not the guys that pay, you know, the next level up. They really are the the absolute, you know, financiers of last resort. They're they're the guys that want the uh, the bear market buy and, and good on them. They make money. They they, they serve a purpose. And um, if they keep the company alive, I mean, certainly um, a drowning man will grab a razor blade, as they say, Bill. Yeah. Well, Gianni, thank you for your insights. If you want to follow Gianni on his day-to-day postings on the copper market and his appearances on shows like mine, you can follow him on Twitter. And I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes. And if you want more information about Copper Bank, uh, Gianni uh, runs that company. And when he finances, he does not issue warrants like he just uh, said. And you can find more information. The link to Copper Bank is in the show notes as well. Gianni, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me again, Bill. 